one side in the front, it said, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. And then on the back it said, whose slave are you? And that's a good question. Whose slave are you? Because in fact, every one of us are slaves. It just depends on whose slave. So as a Christian, you and I have now a new master to obey. We were once slaves of sin. We were once on the broad road that led to destruction. But then we heard the gospel. We responded in obedience. And we changed masters. We changed teams. We're under new management now. Look at verse 17 and verse 18. He says, but, but God, be thanked that though you were slaves, that word is so important right there, were, were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. So we've changed now. We were slaves of sin, B.C., but that's past tense. We're no longer that person anymore. We're no longer slaves of sin. We were at one time, before we responded in obedience to the gospel, before we submitted and presented ourselves to God, and now having been set free from sin, we have become slaves of righteousness. Now notice in verse 17, look at it again. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed the, uh, from the heart, and that's what it has to be, sincerely. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Form of doctrine. Interesting words that Paul uses there. A lot of times people get mad. Ah, oh, doctrine. I don't like doctrine. Blah, blah, blah. Doctrine simply means good teaching. And so it can mean, the word form that's used here can mean print or figure or fashion or a pattern. It's the Greek word typos. From, it's the word, we get our English word type. So it was used to describe a form that was used to, to uh, pour in hot metal into. So you pour this hot metal into this form to shape the metal into the image of the mold. And so the Christian now, we are to be melted, if you will, and poured, poured into the shape and shaped by the doctrine of the Word of God into the image of Jesus. That's God's goal for us. So what we have before us here in the scriptures is what Jude calls the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. This gospel that we have before us here has not changed. It doesn't change with the culture. It doesn't change because people think, well, we've got to modify the gospel. No. We don't, we don't try to say, well, we're going to change the gospel to fit the culture. The culture has to change to fit the gospel. That's how it's supposed to be. So we have the gospel that's been once and for all entrusted to the saints. And it is by believing in this gospel, it is by trusting in this gospel, this doctrine, this teaching, that we are delivered from the darkness. Romans 1.16 says, this, this gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And so as we obey the gospel from the heart, as we believe then we are saved. Look at verse 19. And so he says in verse 19, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members or your parts of your body as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now, in contrast to that, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So you can see that there's sort of this digression or this downward spiral of sin and where it leads to. When you get involved in sin, it gets worse and worse once you yield to it. So he says, lawlessness leading to more lawlessness. The NIV says, ever increasing wickedness. And you can probably look back in your own life. I know I can. And you can recognize this most likely. Sin so often starts in our lives very small. I shared it with you when I was 10 or 11 years old. It was the first time I tasted whiskey. My dad and my uncle, all of them partied. Every occasion, Easter, Christmas, Fourth of July, Mother's Day, 
Earth Day, whatever. You know, it's like, let's drink, you know. Or we go to hunting and fishing, whatever. Let's drink. And so I was exposed to alcohol at a young age. And so what ended up happening, though, is that when you get exposed to sin, it often starts out so small. It starts out seemingly, maybe even seemingly harmless. Insignificant. But soon what will happen, it will enslave your life. And that's what happened to me. I remember I experienced this with drinking. I experienced this with drugs. When I was 18 years old, I've shared this story with you probably before, but maybe some of you haven't heard it. When I was 18 years old, I got a job working for the Santa Monica County Sheriff's Department. And I was a dispatcher. And I was working on the swing shift at night, and we worked in the sheriff's office. And in the office, one of the, one of the sections, they had a giant walk-in safe. It was called the evidence room. And so I was bored one night, and I wasn't having any calls, and so I was walking around trying to stay awake, and I went like this, and I opened the safe. They didn't lock it. And I opened it up, and I turned the light on, and there was all of these shelves and shelves and shelves of, of drugs, of guns, of brass knuckles, all kinds of stuff. And I remember I had never tried smoking pot before. And I, I thought, man, look at all this marijuana. There were bags and bags of it. And I, so I called my friend up, Jeff, I, I, I'm, in, I'm um, putting him in this, so if we go to jail, we'll be there together, you know what I mean? But uh, although it's, it's past the seven-year statute of limitation, I looked into it, that's why I'm telling you the story, okay? Just so you know, right? But anyway, that was a long time ago. And I was only 18, so I just figure out the age, it was a long time ago. But anyway, so we, I called him up, I said, Jeff, get over here, man. I opened the safe, you should see all the marijuana in here, we should try some. And I, I'll never forget, we were so scared. We opened one bag very carefully, and we took out a little tiny bit out of the bag, and we put it back, put it back in the spot, and there was a little pipe there, and we stole the pipe. And I said, I'll meet you after. And I went to his house, and we tried it. And we laughed, we thought it was the funniest thing. So every day I'd go to work, and I'd try to open the safe, and guess what? They kept making the same mistake. But here's what happened. Sin starts off small. We started taking a little bit more, started taking a little bit more, and by the end, we had stole every pound. We stole pounds and pounds of marijuana. We stole brass knuckles. We, like, cleared out that place. Like, yeah, I know. And then there was a big investigation going on. One of the police officers was my friend, and he was a stoner, too. He told us about that they were looking for us. There, were, there was an investigation. I mean, you think about it, that is taking evidence for... Uh, you know, people that are going to court and all that. And so it was a big, it was a felony. And so, you know, it's just a bad thing. And, and so he said, you guys better get rid of the evidence. And we threw all of it in the Rio Grande. We smoked it as fast as we could through the rest of it. The bombs and all that, we threw them in the Rio Grande. And they never caught us, but I just think that the reason they didn't catch us is my dad and the sheriff were real good friends. I'm pretty sure he was me. But by the grace of God, I didn't go to prison. So I could have had a I could have had a prison uh, excursion, but by, by the grace of God, I didn't. But it just goes to show you, sin can start off so small and so innocently, and pretty soon it has you trapped. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, the chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they're too strong to be broken. So even as Christians, we have to be aware of little compromises with sin, with lawlessness. Because the minute you present you, the members of your body or whatever to that sin, you become enslaved to it. And it will often open the door and lead to more and more uncleanness or lawlessness. And soon you won't be strong enough to escape now that you've been enslaved. And you know, it can start off very innocently. You know what, man? The Lord delivered you from all this stuff. And here you are years out and you walk later with the Lord. And someone says, you know what, man? Why don't you drink a beer? But before, you were enslaved to beer. And you're like, you know what, man? I have the freedom in Christ. One beer is not going to hurt me. I'm not going to get drunk. I'm not going to be drunk on one beer. So you drink a beer. But you know what? When you open the door to Satan in any way in your life, especially if you have that area of weakness, soon what will happen is that he will push the door all the way open, and next you'll be drinking six, and then you'll be drinking 12, and pretty soon the chains are right back on you again. And you see, here's the thing about sin, is we cannot beat sin on our own. It will enslave us. 
The only way that we can stay up, I mean, to overcome it is by the power of the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. You see, a lot of people will say, you know what, I've got it under control. I'm free. No, you're not. A lot of times you see the same thing happens with people. They start off with sin. It's a little thing, and pretty soon the chains are too strong to be broken. So we're exhorted in verse 19 as believers, so now present the members of, of, of your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. We're to present or to yield our bodies as slaves of righteousness for the end is holiness. I still, as a Christian, I've been a Christian for 38 years. I just had my birthday, my Christian birthday, and I still do this every single day. I wake up and I say, Lord, here I am. I'm yours, Lord. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. How many of you Christians in this room still get tempted? You get tempted, any of you guys? I know I do. You mean some of you don't ever get tempted? I'm impressed. You should teach me how. How you doing? Right? But, I mean, I still get tempted. And so we need the Lord's help in our lives every single day. Look at verse 20 and verse 21. Notice what it says next. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you were now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. We see here there's a radical contrast between the two kingdoms. Where you were B.C., you were a slave to sin. You had no interest in righteous living. So all you cared about, and if you remember this, and I remember for me, all I cared about, all most of us cared about B.C. was to satisfy our passions and to satisfy our lusts. We only cared about that. Some of you, all you cared about was the next high, the next weekend, the next party, the next, the next drink, the next sexual rendezvous or encounter. You didn't care about pleasing God. All you cared about was pleasing yourself. And Philippians, uh, excuse me, the, the book, the, the, uh, book of, of the same chapter in the Phillips translation, there we go, in the Phillips translation of verse 20 says this, for when you were employed by sin, you owed no duty to righteousness. And so that's where we were. Now next is one of the most sobering and heart-searching reality check questions in all of the Bible. There are questions that we get asked in the Scripture that really cause us to think. And this is one of those in verse 21. Listen to what he